Chapter 18 Family Matters Caden laid on his back on his bed, arms crossed beneath his head and stared up at his ceiling. His ceiling fan spun lazily, cutting stripes of darkness across the white paint. There was a fat, lazy fly that seemed to be chasing very slowly the chain that hung down from the fan and moved in a circle with the swinging of the blades. He sighed. He didn't know if he was the fly, the chain, or the damned fan, but he was sure there was a comparison in there somewhere. Tilly had popped her head in half a dozen times to say hello or show him something or to see if he'd like something to eat. He'd said yes to the latter, but their parents were arguing, quietly but vociferously in the kitchen, so food was out of the question unless he ordered in. But all the takeaway places were sure to be packed after the cancellation of the anniversary celebration. There was talk on the news of today's festivities going tomorrow. But Caden doubted it, for the news was just as breathlessly talking about the bombing and the white dragon and what it all meant. Who cared for an anniversary when the potential of mangled bodies and a ninth dragon shifter were out there? His computer sat on his bed, no longer streaming what was going on. It was too strange to think that he was a part of it. In fact, the longer he stayed in this familiar room, the less he was able to believe that the whole day had happened, but he could still see the white dragon sleeping in his chest, its head hidden underneath a shimmering wing. He wondered if it was normal for it to sleep so much, but then again, they'd had an exhausting day. He should be sleeping too, but on the other hand, how could he? He was supposed to be a mate. Oh God, that word was just gross to one of the dragon shifters and it wasn't going to be Valerius. He had made clear that he didn't even want Caden in his territory, let alone his bed. And I don't want to be there either. I'd rather be alone forever than with him, that arrogant bastard. The white dragon stirred in his chest. If it was awake, he would demand it tell him everything, though it was seemingly new to English. Though were they really communicating in English if they were speaking mind to mind? But he didn't even know its name let alone its purpose in coming to earth and joining to him. Well, if it intended for them to be someone's mate, it would have a thing coming. There was a knock on his door. He didn't bother looking, just called out, Till, whatever it is, it can wait. It's mom, Caden. His mother's voice came muffled through the shut door after a strained moment. He popped upright and smoothed down his hair that was flying in all directions. Oh, mom, come in. The door opened and his mother came in bearing a plate with a sandwich on it and a glass of milk. She gave him a smile when she caught his gaze riveted on the sandwich. I thought you might be hungry. The faith tells us that bonding with the spirit is quite hungry-making work, as well as exhausting. She said the last awkwardly and hovered by the foot of the bed. Oh yeah, here, let me grab that. He stood up and took the plate and cup from her before gesturing with his head that she should sit down. He immediately took a bite of sandwich. It was roast turkey, Swiss cheese, garden tomatoes, and creamy mayo, all on fresh sourdough bread, and a swallow of milk to wash it down. His mother perched on the edge of the bed and watched him eat in silence. It was so not like her. Not that she was terribly chatty. His mother said what she meant and was to the point, but they'd always had an easy rapport between them. But as the silence dragged on, his shoulders grew tight. Mom? He asked, around a mouthful of sandwich. Are you okay? I mean, I'm fine. She gave him a bright smile that was fragile, too. Oh. He swallowed the sandwich and another sip of milk. It gave him time to figure out how to summit this mountain that his mother was representing at this moment. You and Dad? Done talking? The facade cracked. You mean arguing? We have a detente. But things are not settled, not by long shot. He does not understand that these things are beyond us. He frowned. What things? His mother's hands fussed in her lap. She stared down at them. The, the fates of the spirits determine our lives, and they have chosen how this is to go. How is what supposed to go? He raised his eyebrows. Your life now. She rubbed her palms against the tops of her pants. We can wish for things, but the spirits have determined nothing. 
He interrupted her. The word mate flashed through his mind. He set the cup and plate to the side and grasped his mother's questing hands in his. Only then did they still. He studied her face. Mom, my fate is still my own. I'm not giving up my life to the will of some spirit. After all, I was here first. But, but his dragon spirit, Caden, this is no ordinary being. If any spirit could be considered ordinary, but mom, how many shifters have you met? He asked her. Well, you mean outside of today? I I've met some. Your father's partners, of course. She said. Yeah, and do any of them seem like the type of people you want to worship or give your fate over to? He had never challenged her directly on her faith like this. She blinked. And no, but they are the human vessels for the spirits that, Mom, they're people. And the spirits are, well, they're people too. Or more like they have as many flaws as people do. Believe me that Raziel is a right bastard, just like Valerius, and, oh, you mustn't say that. His mother's eyes were huge. You met him, Mom. If Valerius wasn't a shifter, you would have told him where to get off. You would never have let him threaten Wally and Landry. You would never have allowed him to get away with any of it. He protested. She blinked and looked away. Did he hurt you? When we were fighting? Um, yeah. Razio wanted to kill me. Valerius didn't, but... He stopped and winced. This was not something he should tell anyone, not even his mother. Look, it's cleared up now. Sort of. I've told him what's what. What do you mean? She was looking at him with huge eyes again. Just that my life is my own. That I'm staying here, working at Wally's, and that nothing is going to change. He said with a shrug, even though his stomach twisted itself into knots. When his mother gave him a disbelieving look, just like Shioni and Valerius had, he added quickly, Unless I choose it, any change that happens, I'm going to choose. He wondered if he should tell her about the mate thing, and the other dragon shifters coming to present themselves to win his favor. Or kill me when I say no to all of them. Yeah, maybe I'll keep this to myself for now. You are a dragon shifter now. You have a say in things. You have a say in the whole world. She murmured. No, Mom, God, no. Even if such a thing were possible... I am still your son, your very stupid son. You don't want me to have a say in how the world is run unless, unless yesterday, before all of this happened, you believed it. He said, and pressed her hands in his. A slight look of disbelief crossed her face, which told him that he was reaching her. If she thought logically about it, she would realize it was crazy to suddenly think he was worthy of ruling anyone, let alone the world. I see what you're trying to do, Caden, and maybe you're right that I'm too much involved in the faith to really see what's going on with you, but, but I'm not all wrong, you know. She cupped his cheek. Her hand trembled slightly. In some ways, we've lost you to this. Only if you stop being my mom. I need you and Dad and Tilly more than ever. A spasm of guilt appeared on her face. I can't do this without you guys. I really can't. Don't leave me now when I really need you. Oh, Caden, I'm not. I would never leave you. I just am recognizing that some of this is going to be beyond me. Some of this is between you and the spirit. Mom, the spirit is mostly sleeping. He put both hands against his chest. It's really cute. Don't get me wrong, but it's childlike yet, I think. Or it seems more innocent to me than like Raziel. His mouth writhed back from his teeth like he'd tasted something sour. The white dragon liked the other spirit, but Caden couldn't see much in Raziel or the one it was bound to. His mother gave him a sweet smile. It's because the spirit is new, at least to this world. Give it time. I'm sure it has much to teach you, to teach all of us. Caden gave her a smile, but it was sort of sad. Maybe, I don't know. She rubbed his chin with her thumb affectionately. While he wasn't completely satisfied with this conversation, it appeared that his mother was more relaxed around him now. 
He could well understand his father losing his temper over this. His father worked closely with shifters, so his wife being part of the faith and worshipping them as greater beings just added into the impression that humans were lesser. He understood his father's feelings after meeting the two partners tonight. His mother picked up the plate and cup. Do you want anything more? No, I'm good. I'm going to try and get some sleep. I have to work early tomorrow. He told her. Her smile went a little rigid and her voice was falsely bright. After the excitement of today, Wally won't give you any time off? I didn't ask. Maybe you should. I think he would understand. And maybe it would be better if you did. Your father is going to meet with his partners and I want to go in. It'll help me not think about things. Nobody knows who I am. It'll be fine. He said with another shrug. She nodded jerkily and he knew that she didn't agree with it. She would likely try to convince him to stay home tomorrow. He would have to sneak out without her noticing. He needed the headspace that stocking shelves and hearing Wally complain about the sales tax would. He also wanted to talk to Wally to find out who he really was. Wally's view of shifters really made more sense now. He wondered if Landry would be able to stand working with two shifters. Well, good night then. I'll see you tomorrow. She hovered by the door for a long moment, her gaze lingering on him like she was trying to memorize him, as if he might disappear like smoke in the wind. Yeah, good night. She smiled and closed the door behind her. As far as I know, this gay romantic story isn't like anything else out there. At least not yet. While it's exciting to be trailblazers, it also means that all our support comes directly from listeners, customers, and subscribers, just like you. We aren't going to get picked up by a larger publisher like Amazon or Netflix. And if they were interested, chances are they'd want to make it, you know, not so gay. We're just not there yet. If you find something you love and it's independently produced, it's so important to support it. You are the only reason that productions with total creative freedom like ours can exist. There was a soft ding from his computer and he saw that he had an email. He frowned. It wasn't from an address he recognized. Flower. Rose. He quickly clicked on the email and saw it was indeed from the B shifter. It read, Caden, i.e. the big-hearted idiot. So, I'm emailing you. So old-fashioned, because I'm chicken shit. Emailing means I don't have to stare at my phone to see if you're going to return my tax right away. I mean, why would you? And I couldn't say what I really mean if I texted or phoned or, damn, saw you in person. I don't even know if you would have stayed still to let me speak. I wouldn't blame you for that. It's so stupid. We just met. It's not like I owe you anything. I mean, we're not exactly friends. But I can't get your stupid face out of my head. You're so freaking nice. And that's rare. Maybe as rare as being a dragon shifter. At least to people like me. So, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that I was a part of that thing with Marban, but the problem is that I don't really have a choice and maybe you should just ignore this email and forget me. Because if we became friends, if somehow you still wanted to be, he'll use that. I won't be able to stop him. Anyways, I don't know why I wrote this and I shouldn't send it, but if I do, don't answer. That would be better for you. Rose. Caden wrote back. Rose. Meet me at Wally's tomorrow around noon. We could get lunch. I really could use a friend of right about now. Caden. He hit send and smiled. They were friends. And maybe he could help her. Or maybe Wally could help her. He knew Marban and had gotten out of that life. Maybe he could give her a job, if nothing else. That was one thing sorted anyways. There was another knock at his door. He frowned. It wasn't Tilly. She didn't knock, or rather, she'd rap a few times and then barge right in, so either it was his mum or... Caden? His father's voice rose up. The whole family wants to have a chat. Come in, Dad. He called. His father came in. He was still dressed in the white button-down shirt and dress pants that he had put on that morning, except now the sleeves of the shirt were rolled up to his elbows. 
The suit coat was likely draped over the back of some chair, and his tie was likely coiled on the kitchen table where it inevitably ended up. Hey, Caden, he said as he closed the door behind him softly. How are you doing? Caden opened his mouth to say fine, but instead admitted, I don't know. It's weird, but I felt more in control in high reach than at home. His father sat down in the spot that his mother had vacated. He nodded. New places allow us to act like new people. Nothing to ground us. Or keep us down, depending on how you look at it. Maybe you're right. I thought familiar stuff would make me feel, I don't know, like me? But none of this is really like me, is it? His father reached out and grasped his left shoulder. It is you, Caden. I'm not surprised at all this happened to you. What? Oh, come on, Dad. He let out a strangled laugh, but his father's face remained quite serious and somber. No, because I have no difficulty imagining you sacrificing yourself for others. That was heroic, what you did, you know. It was truly extraordinary. Caden blushed and looked down at his blue comforter. He'd had this one for a couple of years. It was soft from use, rather like an old t-shirt, and he loved how cool it felt on his skin at night. But now it seemed wrong somehow, and he couldn't figure out why. Dad, I'm not any of that. You are, Caden. He chanced to look up, but his father was still staring at him. There were dark circles under his father's eyes, and more wrinkles than had been there that morning. His father was exhausted and worried and trying to figure out what to do. At least his father didn't think Caden was ready to rule the world, but his father might not give him any credit to do anything. Not that his dad didn't think he was smart or capable. He thought him heroic. But Caden knew his father had more experience with the politics of the shifter world than any of them. I'm surprised Frick and Frack aren't here. Caden remarked. Who? His father's eyebrows rose. Storn and Moore. I imagine they don't want you out of their sight. Caden said. His father chuckled and rubbed his jaw, which was already sporting dark whiskers with just a hint of grey in them. Caden imagined that beard and hair on his father's head snow white. He imagined those tired lines permanent and deeper. He imagined his father old, and he would still look the same. They went back to the office to round up all the troops. They'll be working all night to get every scrap of lore out there to help us. Help you, his father explained. I'm working remotely from here. I just wanted to check in on you. Dad, I don't know if the law is really going to... We have to protect your rights, Caden. His father interrupted firmly. I don't think Valerius really cares about the law or any amount of briefs your firm will give him. Caden admitted with a sheepish look, but his father's expression darkened. He better. What? Why? Because if the law is proved an illusion, then he'll have riots on his hands. His father pointed towards his window. The old oak was just a few feet from the outside sill. He'd climbed out of his room on its sturdy trunk plenty of times. Beyond, it was the yard and the night-darkened streets. The empty streets. Hardly an apt metaphor for a riot, but his father's hand was firm. The shifters think that they are always going to be on top because they're stronger than humans. But there are more humans, and more people joining humans first all the time. Caden's forehead furrowed. Those guys are a bunch of thugs. They're like the Nazis. I'm not saying it's right, Caden. I think they're scum too, but a lot of people, a lot of humans, are angry at how things are. His father said, the lack of jobs, the lack of advancement, watching shifters take all the best and leave us scraps. Us? Caden's eyebrows rose. It certainly sounded like his father was more sympathetic to the human's first cause than he was letting on directly. Dad. You're a lawyer. I mean, I get it that you probably deserve more than the firm and your partners are jerks, but but that's hardly scraps. His father's lips pressed together. No, you're right. It's just... He looked away for a moment. Every time I go into the office, no matter how good an attorney I am, I feel everyone else just sees the token human. Dad. Caden reached for his dad. They hugged briefly. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to downplay. Of course you didn't. But Caden, my point is that the law is what keeps everyone equal. It's the last bastion of equality, his father explained. 
If Valerius doesn't recognize it, then we're under a dictatorship, and I don't know what will happen. Valerius isn't a dictator, Caden argued. He's just grouchy. His father's eyebrows rose. Grouchy? Caden nodded. Yeah, and a white bastard. But he's not like Alarian. Not at all. But his father's expression hadn't really softened. We'll see. His father stood up. I've got to get back at it. But I just don't want you to worry, Caden. We're going to get things sorted. We're going to protect you. I promise. Caden nodded, but didn't say anything. In truth, since this conversation, he felt less safe than before. Maybe he shouldn't have stormed out of high reach after that mate revelation. Maybe he should have stayed and talked it out. Shioni would have helped him find a way forward, he was sure of that. Now he found that he absolutely couldn't say a word to his parents about this mate thing. He dreaded what they would do. His father said goodnight and shut the door. Caden flopped back down onto his bed. He saw that the fly had finally caught the chain and was riding it easily as it spun. He turned his head to the side and looked out the window. A shadow passed over their house, blocking out the moon. It moved too fast to be a cloud. It was too large to be a plane. There was only one thing, one person, it could be. Caden rolled off of the bed and raced over to the window. He yanked the screen up and stuck his head out. He scanned the sky. It didn't take him long to see Valerius flying above the mid, and with a sudden burst of happiness that he would deny he felt later, he thought, He's watching over me. While we make a little ad money from YouTube, Wraith Rain is mostly supported by our memberships, Amazon sales, and shop sales. If you subscribe to us, you get uncensored audio episodes, exclusive gay romance stories, the ability to read and comment on chapters the instant I publish them, and 60% discounts on audiobooks in our shop. Not a subscription person? You can also buy audiobooks, ebooks, and hardcovers from our shop. Links to both the sign up page and shop are in the notes.